Welcome to Flat, Cool, and Acid-Free, an OK State Archives podcast, bringing you stories about Oklahoma State University and Oklahoma. On this episode... We've really been in the last generation who began expanding into more three-dimensional uh, objects. Uh, we've really actually benefited a lot from the work that the, the folks in the museum world do. We are talking about museums and archives. We're going to chat about collection material and the process to get them ready to be viewed, both from the museum perspective as well as an archive's perspective. Chatting with us today, we have Carla Christina here from the Oklahoma State University Museum of Art. Folks, it is so good to chat with you today and thank you for joining us. Of course, we have David Peters from the University Archives who also joins us today. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. How's it going? Now, these two entities, I feel, are so interconnected because they house cultural resources, but they also have some distinctions at the same time. So before we get too far into it, let's introduce ourselves and tell me a little bit about the OSU Museum of Art. I'm Christina, and I am the Associate Curator of Education at the Oklahoma State University Museum of Arts. Um, The museum itself has been collecting art since the 1930s, and so a lot of people are surprised to know that our collections go back that far. Um, As our museum itself was only uh, really established in the early 2000s and the 2010s. Um, So over time, the museum amassed this collection that really outgrew its home in the art department and in the Gardner Gallery. So in 2010, uh, the OSU Regents approved the purchase of the historic Postal Plaza in downtown Stillwater. Um, In 2013, we opened our doors as sort of a soft opening and had our first official exhibition in 2014. Um, Even in this uh, sort of short period that we've been officially opened, uh, our collection has grown. It started at about 3,000 objects and now Um, Just about six years later, it's at over 6,000 objects, so it has doubled during this time period. Um, And it really has a wide breadth of different disciplines, but it mostly focuses on works of fine art um, from the modern and contemporary period, as well as works on paper and industrial design. Um, My name is Carla Shelton, and my short title is Associate Director and Chief Registrar at the OSU Museum of Art. Um, Besides those administrative duties, um, I help manage the permanent collection along with new acquisitions. I also build and manage the deadlines for exhibitions, coordinate those logistics, and the install schedule for our shows that come through our building. Yeah, Carla helps corral this and really manage these 6,000 objects uh, and the installation of them in the Postal Plaza, how they traffic through sort of that area. So David, talk to me a little bit about the archives. What does the OSU archives do? And tell me what you do for them. So I serve as the director of the Oklahoma State University Archives. Um, We have roughly 1,400 collections. Uh, We've been actively collecting for over 65 years now. Uh, We have objects that are hundreds of years old uh, as a part of our collections, and then we have things that are more current, of course. Uh, Traditionally, we collected uh, paper, uh, you know, documents, uh, records of those uh, two dimensions, uh, length and width. Uh, We have a lot of photographs, uh, um, and it's only really been in the last, uh, probably within this last generation, we began expanding into more three-dimensional objects. Uh, And so that's kind of a new realm for us. Uh, and the management of those are different and we're discovering that of course than, than paper and so uh, we've really actually benefited a lot from the work that the, the folks in the museum world do this movement into the three-dimensional world uh, because we, we began to realize that not all records not all cultural memory is is stored on paper uh, a lot of societies and cultures uh, uh, record the essence of their being on in song and in dance and in a variety of other ways that archives traditionally didn't collect. Um, and so, you know, as we've tried to be culturally sensitive and culturally aware, you know, we've moved into collecting new kinds of record keeping that's on, on objects or, or materials that we weren't familiar with or, or weren't, didn't have much con, uh, uh, experience with. And so here, I think moving forward, especially into the future, we'll become more and more uh, dependent on 
um, partnerships and collaborations with others who are are better uh, skilled with um, uh, storing, maintaining, writing contextual analysis and relationships for these objects. Um, and, and so that we don't lose the meanings that, that is attached to those. Because once we lose those meanings, then uh, the essence of, of that is, has been lost. Uh, and, and many of these things have almost a sacred meaning uh, for many people. And so uh, it really is a responsibility for us going forward to, to try to capture uh, as much of that in a sensitive um, and respectful way uh, as people uh, would wish to share. But uh, we have a great diversity of collections. Uh, our, our primary uh, objective is to serve as the repository for the official administrative records for Oklahoma State University. And then we have collections related to um, really the goals of the institution. We have uh, records related to agriculture and renewable resources, to those who have done uh, public service, uh, former uh, uh, political office holders, military service as uh, another. We've had a number of individuals who've served in the military. And most of these individuals have some relationship to Oklahoma State University. Either they've been on the faculty or staff here uh, or were students here. Uh, and then we also have our women's archive. Uh, we have our business and entrepreneurship collections. Um, and then more recently, we've been uh, collaborating with um, the Oklahoma Oral Research uh, Program and developing a uh, Native American artists uh, and art uh, and authors uh, collection uh, to go along with some of the uh, oral histories they've been engaged in. That kind of, kind of touches most bases that we do. So, How does a collection get to you? <laughs> Tell me what that looks like. Um, and what does the beginning of a collection process look like for both the museum and the archives? Carla? Um, sure. So there are very, very many facets to getting a collection, as David probably understands as well. Um, we think about the content of the collection, what is in it, what use does it serve us, can we take care of it. Um, we think about things like who that audience is, are those objects in good condition that they, we can even show them safely, and are they interesting, are they educational. We have worked with many OSU partners, faculty, community members to accumulate these objects. A lot of our donors are OSU alumni and community members. We do not have um, an acquisitions fund, so we rely on donations. Um, but with that said, we can't take everything. We have a limited amount of space, and sometimes those objects, again, are in poor condition, so it would be very costly for us to conserve them. Sometimes those objects are just not relevant to our scope of collection. We are not a history museum, so we're not really interested in those historical objects. We're not a science museum either, so we're not interested in those objects. And all of those potential donations we discuss amongst our collections committee. We decide if we can properly take care of that, if it fills a gap that we're missing, and if it fits our mission. And we know a lot of museums within the state and the region specialize in a lot of content areas, so we try not to duplicate those efforts as well. So we're looking for unique objects that kind of speak to fine art in particular. For, for the archives, of course, we have a, a collection development uh, policy, which hopefully guides uh, most of the accessions we, we uh, things we acquire. Uh, we don't have a budget either. Uh, we have a, well, we have a small budget for, for really book items, but not really for collections. So we rely heavily upon donations. The two main ways that materials get to us, first of all, uh, as the archive for the institution, uh, records are simply transferred from departments uh, across campus to our, our holdings. And so whether it's the Board of Regents or the President's Office or Dean's Offices, wh whatever administrative unit on campus, there are certain records that they're required or mandated to transfer to us. So that's that's one way materials get to us. But then a lot of our collections, of course, uh, are, are materials that people have donated to us. And we try to work closely with them. So we have some idea uh, beforehand if we're the best home for that material. We've been given the opportunity to collect certain things, um, but we really aren't the best home for that. And so we try to, we try to encourage the, the potential donor to consider other places. And we try to work with those other archives and sometimes uh, museums and, and other uh, entities to find the best home, uh, especially for researchers. They're, they're probably not going to come here. They might go someplace else uh, uh, for that kind of material. But now certain things, we know they're going to come here. And so we're going to try to augment our materials by adding to that with additional resources that, that donors uh, may bring to us. Sometimes it's a real adventure uh, in trying to figure out how we're going to manage uh, a collection of material that came in. 
but most people have have some idea of, of uh, and have some, have some way of managing that material. And we try to augment that or, or, or at least utilize that as, as a starting point for how we're going to manage the material going forward. Ultimately, though, we want the materials to be arranged in a way that's easiest for the researcher to have access to them. We don't want, want to make that that end of the um, uh, the whole timeline difficult for the for the researcher at the end. So. So you mentioned before that you have worked with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program with the Native American Artists Collection. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been to the gallery for that some years ago and took some 360 video that was fantastic. It was a beautiful display in the museum. Y'all did an excellent job with that. But you also have something in common now. Can you tell me a little bit about the Kravis Collection? In 2017, we put together a show called Oklahoma and Beyond, which was selections from the George R. Kravis II collection. And that featured over 40 works from George Kravis's private collection. He is a private collector or was a private collector and a huge supporter of the arts in Tulsa. And his collection, specifically his design collection, was nationally renowned. He had loaned to many institutions. Um, overseas and, and within the country. And so from that point on, we established a great relationship with him and talked about donating some of those pieces to the museum. Um, unfortunately, in February of 2018, um, George passed away. And through the dissemination of his estate, the museum was selected to receive his, the majority of his fine art collection and along with um, selections of that design collection as well. We received over 700 works of fine art and design, and it's made a wonderful addition to our permanent collection. So when we found out, we were really excited, and we uh, went over and worked with Georgia's staff to pack and prepare that delivery of the art. And we're still working on us getting everything integrated into our permanent collection but we have already produced some great exhibitions with that wonderful collection. Um, that collection spans from a Frank Lloyd Wright um, chair to a Roy Lichtenstein print. We have paintings and ceramic. Um, so it has a great, fabulous, fantastic addition to our permanent collection. So the relationship that the OSU Museum of Art built with, uh, first of all, with Mr. Kravis and then, and then with his staff afterwards, Mr. Kravis also collected uh, a lot of reference materials uh, and, and books, thousands of books uh, about all kinds of design. Um, uh, it's amazing how much design is impacting a, a lot of different areas, but he collected, uh, well, I, I think it's over 5,000 volumes. It, it's a huge collection. And, and just like the Museum of Art, we are still processing through that material. Uh, we're not used to that large of volume uh, to all come at one time, um, but working with his his staff, we were methodically going through and cataloging each individual item. Um, many of the items there were, or at least some of the items there were duplicates of, and so we've been also working with his staff to determine the best way to distribute some of those items so that the other uh, institutions might be able to benefit um, because we won't need multiple copies of a certain item. Um, but there are literally thousands of books. Um, and we are trying to uh, catalog and then and then we'll be housing them um, at our uh, library auxiliary building, which has the best environmental conditions uh, for archival materials and library materials on campus. And so they'll be placed in archival containers uh, and then housed out there uh, once we have the inventory completed. And then they can be retrieved anytime a researcher will want to have access to them. But uh, really, it was the relationship that the Museum of OSU Museum of Art uh, developed with Mr. Kravis. Uh, that then led to us receiving that donation of materials related to uh, design. And hopefully it'll be a complement to uh, the art items that the Ocean Museum of Art has uh, with having this background of, of reference materials uh, that he utilized. So, And there's that interconnection, that, that's those similarities between you're cultivating this collection and making sure that it has the right home and the correct environment and also having it available in some way take us through the process of a collection like this. So how much time do you spend working on the different parts, the, the exhibit, the research, the collection, the material, and then the implementation of that exhibit, um, if there is one? Um, we are usually, hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, planning an exhibition about three years out. We already have things on the books for 2023. 
Um, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of scheduling, a lot of logistics to get things and people from here to there and back again. So we have um, a lot of factors in, at play. So we, depending on the content of that and our partnerships that we're developing with an exhibition, it could take years or months depending on those factors. Um, also factored in how complicated that work is physically to hang or to do research on, um, how ac accessible it is. Um, sometimes we've done installations specific to our building. So we have artists actually come in and help us install and tell that story and their, what they're thinking, how they've made it. And during that time, we usually partner with a lot of OSU faculty members. They do workshops. They go to the Prairie Arts Center and teach some classrooms for children's K through 12. Um, they talk to students about how to make art, how to become a professional artist. So we try to get them um, in both realms, them as the artists and them actually teaching. If it's a more traditional um, exhibition that requires unique research, it could take longer. Um, our curator right now is working on content for an exhibition scheduled for 2022 on an Oklahoma-born artist named Leon Polk Smith, and he was best known for his hard edge and minimalist um, artistic style. And so she has been researching him since 2015 when she, we received another large donation from a Leon Polk Smith Foundation in New York as well. So depending on the complexity, our partnerships, um, it could take quite a while. So two to three years for a, one of our larger shows. Well, and see for the archives world, we really aren't thinking about an exhibition uh, at all, um, especially with books. I mean, I could have shelves and shelves of the Kravis book collection on a shelf for people to look at, but that's, that's a whole different kind of exhibit kind of uh, um, uh, presentation than you'd find in an art museum. I mean, we're designed more for the preservation and care of those materials. And then we can bring materials out and, and display individual items or, or feature items uh, as part of a, an exhibit. Um, and and I'm, I'm sure at some point in time, uh, we'll, we'll work with uh, the Museum of Art to maybe have some uh, image items, uh, maybe copies of things uh, that we can display and then show design features that are augmented or, or highlighted in certain books uh, and try to build a, re a relationship with those items and then display that in an exhibit. But we really don't, uh, we don't think of things uh, for the exhibit potential. Um, we think of them more as the preservation uh, difficulties and challenges and then access potential uh, for researchers. And so it's a, a little different uh, uh, perspective uh, when it comes to, to managing those kinds of, of features for a collection. The Zaro collection, in this case, we have a much larger representation of the art items themselves in the archives. Um, and there, uh, going forward, we'll probably be looking to uh, the OSU Museum of Art for guidelines on how to best store and preserve those materials and how to integrate those materials then into exhibit possibilities. Uh, both in the library and, and maybe elsewhere. But um, uh, that is a fascinating collection, uh, a lot of Native American art within that collection. I believe the Ocean Museum of Art does have a few of the items uh, from the Zaro collection, or at least from the Zaro family. Um, and then we have the vast majority of materials in the archives. And, and that is one area where we have to, we'll have to think differently uh, as we prepare for uh, potential storage and exhibit uh, uh, activities regarding the Zaro collection. Now, one thing I read was that an archive doesn't necessarily have a museum, but a museum could most definitely have an archive. And that's kind of where that separates. Um, a lot of museums have an archive. They're usually an archive of material specifically about their collection, um, such as those design books that we handed over to the library um, or information pertaining to the artists themselves, artist sketches, bios, resumes, things that pertain to the exhibition history of an object um, can go into those files. We personally are not set up to be an archive that requires a lot more space, a lot more specialty than what we have. But luckily, we're part of a larger OSU organization that we have team members in the library that we can be like, we have all this, this wonderful material, but we don't have the capacity or the knowledge that you guys have an archive. So that's how we're trying to create those links between we can take care of the physical and we can um, make it accessible to our students and our faculty 
um, but also we need the expertise that the archive provide for us and we know that they're equally as accessible to to the, the students at large they're on campus which is really easy to get to they're a hub of place students always congregate there they're using it so it's way more easier and they can facilitate um, people accessing that collection and and what's what's in this case very similar in that both museums and archives will have records that they're managing they have a records management you know and so they have we have files on our donors the deeds of gifts, those, those official kind of documents that provide um, kind of the stability of knowing we have the materials that they say we have. Uh, and the museum will have the same kind of records regarding their donors. And, and um, uh, so that there's a records management function that both both groups will, will have. But yeah, we really, until recently, the, the library had very little exhibit space. Uh, and now we have, you know, kind of that gallery area on the second floor um, to begin uh, exhibiting materials. Yeah, we leave we leave the expertise there to the to the folks in art uh, and 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 use their guidance. But we have similarities too. But when we do exhibit materials, you know, there's 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 issues related to light uh, and and the kinds of light you're using, the amount of light you're using, uh, how long objects uh, can be placed out in the public, and whether you need to rotate those things through at a regular period of time. And so we we both share similar kind of concerns when we are exhibiting original materials. Um, uh, on protecting those materials while they're on exhibit. Uh, and if possible, you know, what we do in the archives is try to create facsimiles that someone would know that's a, a copy um, if you don't have to display an original. But, you know, we have similar concerns when it comes to exhibits, um, both in the museum world and the archives world, of, of ensuring that we are uh, doing nothing to jeopardize the integrity of those materials while they're on display. And yet you do want to share them. I mean, why, why keep materials and, and not share them? And so there's a, there's a, um, a strong desire uh, to be able to share what you have. And I think that's especially true in the art world, but it's true in the, in the archives world too. Um, um, but, you know, to give, an, uh, give people an idea of the kinds of materials we have and the various uh, relationships that can be built with those materials to other subject areas and other activities that they may be involved with that they hadn't thought of earlier, so. And that's a great transition, this next point you both have your sharing of collections and being an academic resource as part of your mission, and that's your core. Um, how do you both go about fulfilling that mission for the OSU community and the larger community of Oklahoma? As one of the museum educators, um, I'll speak to that point. Uh, we are a university museum, um, and that's really important to us uh, to sort of fulfill that educational component. So education and outreach has always been one of our primary goals. Um, we're always thinking uh, about educational programming and audience interaction when we curate an exhibition. How Carla said, you know, two to three years minimum. Even then, we're having brainstorming sessions to talk about how we can make this relatable or how we can create interactives um, that are educational or really help the community come into the exhibition and understand it. So we provide these educational materials in our gallery space through interpretive panels. We also have exhibition catalogs or brochures on aspects of the collection that are being shown. We also have family guides and activity bags um, that people can pick up as they come into the gallery and carry around with them. A lot of times these gallery guides will have activities or treasure hunts quizzes that families can do while they're walking through uh, the gallery spaces. We also have uh, an art and innovation lab, our art lab, which was partially funded by George Kravis as well. Um, and this really promotes STEAM-based learning. We're uh, inserting that A in there for the arts. And so um, a large part of the Kravis collection is that industrial design aspect and so uh, it's important to us to incorporate art and technology um, science engineering math uh, into our art lab and so even as people sort of round um, our the corner of our fisher gallery they'll enter the art lab and there's always activities set up in there for them um, we also host class visits and lectures as carla said with our visiting artists um, at both the college and the K through 12 level, as well as partnering with faculty members. Um, so when we bring in a visiting lecturer, we sort of make sure to connect the dots between what's happening in an exhibition and what students are talking about or really learning about in their courses. 
We do a whole lot. I mean, I could go on and on. Uh, as Carla also mentioned, um, we have a second uh, associate curator of education who specifically works with K through 12 programming. And so we're reaching out um, to all of the el elementary schools, high schools, the Prairie Arts Center, and going that extra step for just even community engagement with our grandparent university. We do OLLI classes. We have open um, public sessions during our second Saturday events. It, it, we're always trying to do more when it comes to our educational directives. In the archives world, traditionally we have very small public spaces. In fact, we restrict space because we want to be able to control both who has access to that space and then, and then the accessibility of the materials within that space. Uh, and so our, our concern was mostly security uh, rather than inviting the public in, you know, to, to uh, view materials uh, in, in mass. But we've had to, we've had to overcome that uh, by really reaching out, you know, in the past, when I started in the archives world, you know, 30 years ago, we were building walls and, and moats and trenches and trying to keep people away because we were trying to preserve materials and, and the less uh, access to a material you have, the longer it's going to last because you're not going to wear it out. Well, there's been a 180 degree change now. You know, now we are trying to figure out ways of inviting people not only to come to our spaces, but for us to go into their spaces. Uh, we can't just wait for them to come to us. And so we do have small classes, like I'm, I'm limited to about 15 people uh, at, at a session, but come into the archives uh, for work uh, in, our, in our department. Uh, but I'm, I'm, we're going out more and more into classrooms across campus um, and into a variety of different uh, locations across campus, not just classrooms, uh, where we either take materials with us or, or share the experience of the archives uh, out with them. Uh, this is where we've been dependent upon uh, social media uh, to provide access for individuals to the kinds of collections we have. And so uh, our work with Facebook, uh, and we've had a, a student intern uh, that um, Nina knows well, but uh, we've had several interns who who kind of help exhibit the kinds of materials we have on Facebook. We do the Archives Live, which is a Facebook Live to also expose uh, individuals to the types of collections we have and the materials within those collections. Um, and so we have really had to uh, adopt kind of the extension model of going out uh, and serving the public uh, wherever they are and not waiting for them to come to us. Uh, and really, it's been a, quite a dramatic change. And I think it's a successful change. Uh, and how the archives are viewed. And, and also it gives us more of a, a standing and that people have a feeling for why there is an archive. Uh, it's still, we're still kind of a secret. Uh, a lot of people don't even know that OSU has an archive. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just sharing that uh, information out there, uh, we're getting more and more buy-in. Um, we're getting more uh, collections coming our way because people are aware that we, we do collect. Um, and uh, uh, overall, it's a way of us reaching the public so if somebody wanted to utilize your resources, website, contact info, lay it on me. Let me know how somebody can get a hold of you at the museum and you at the archives. Our Facebook tag is Oklahoma State University Museum of Art. Um, our Instagram is OSU Museum of Art, all one word. Um, you can also just email us or call us, although uh, the museum is temporarily closed right now. Uh, our staff is still working. We're still, uh, the, the back of house staff is still uh, open and ongoing. And you can email us um, at museum at okstate.edu or give us a call at 405-744-2780. For the university archives, they can get to, to uh, our web presence uh, through the OSU library. They just go to the library and they can select uh, uh, archives as an option uh, and they can get to our, our web presence that way. They can also get to the digital collections through the OSU uh, library webpage. Um, we also have a Facebook account. Uh, they can get to us on YouTube and O-State TV. Um, uh, so there's a variety of ways to get to us. Uh, all of uh, the phones, in my office have been forwarded to my home phone uh, so I can still take calls here. And our library, our archives department email has all been forwarded, I'm, I'm reviewing that. Uh, and so we're still responding to reference questions uh, through uh, via email and phone. Um, and so uh, we're still trying to provide as many services as we can. So uh, the telephone number is 405-744-6311. Uh, that'll get to me here uh, at, at my home base, um, and they can uh, also reach us uh, via email. 
experience collections from both the OSU Museum of Art and the University Archives online through video and digital materials. There are tons of links in the show notes to get you where you want to be. Visit the links in the bio for daily art video segments on social media, as well as OSU Archives videos on YouTube. Make sure to check out the Archives and the Museum's Facebook, where you'll find amazing stories, photos, and museum artwork. This episode featured Carla Shelton, Christina Elliott, and David Peters, and it was produced by Nina Thornton. The music is It's a Process, composed by Ben Stone and Finley Green, and published by BBC Production Music PRS. From the folks at Oklahoma State University Libraries, the OSU Archives, and the OSU Museum of Art, thanks for listening, and always remember to keep your archival material flat, cool, and acid-free. <laughs>